Hello and welcome. I'm Lee Peterson. I am the host of the weekly podcast known as WD Cast. And the reason it's called WD Cast is because it is brought to you by WD Partners. They call themselves Thinkers That Do. And today we're going to be talking to Dan Stanick about his new white paper, which is called Healthcare Who Survives. And so, you know, before we get into this, you will be able to download this healthcare paper for free uh, at wdpartners.com slash healthcare podcast. And uh, I will tell you right now that there's a lot of very valuable information on that. And Dan and I are about to get into that now. I have with me the famous and the fabulous Dan Stanick, who's been in this business for a long time. He is the EVP of Health and Wellness for WD Partners. Hi, Dan. Hey, Lee. I'd uh, say infamous, probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's your call, man. <laughs> uh, okay, so we're going to talk about a little bit about a white paper that you just put out that's uh, some... We had some pretty significant findings, yeah, which I found really interesting. But b- before we do that, could you just tell everybody who you are, a little bit of a background piece on you? Sure. So as you mentioned, I've been in this business for quite a while, over 30 years, and uh, and really have, have been in one uh, sense uh, a consultant, a, a pure management consultant looking at the retail industry primarily. And then also have had a number of positions in leadership with uh, various design agencies. So I've had one foot in traditional management consulting and another in how that consulting and how that strategy strategy is activated through the process of design. And, uh, and so um, today, uh, in, as a leader of health and wellness at WD Partners, what we're doing is helping to activate those customer experiences which need to be changed in, in the healthcare world. And, uh, and not just strategizing what those models should be, but then activating them in, in, a, in a physical experience design. And by activating, you mean bringing them to life. That's correct. Yeah. So in some senses, it could be a building. In other senses, it could be people. Exactly. Exactly. The way technology interacts, people interact, facilities interact, all of those things are what create that experience. And Dan, in in your paper, Healthcare, Who Survives, which is a great title because I think there's there's so much uh, disruption within the category, you talked to over 2,600 consumers uh, across the country with all different variations of... uh, genetics, et cetera, uh, available. So it's not just a small survey. This is not just uh, three or 400 people that you spoke to, but over 2,600 people, which I think is really significant. So let's keep that in mind as we go through some of the results. Mm-hmm. So it, you also mentioned that uh, the coming threat to primary care physicians within healthcare, which is predominantly the way that, that Americans mm-hmm. have got their health care. And uh, myself included, you just went to a doctor, went to a doctor my whole life. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly, like, infringing upon all this is, uh, you know, urgent care and, and you know, small, uh, what we call dock in the boxes mm-hmm. have all of a sudden started to pop up. And then even I find myself saying, well, if I have a doctor's appointment, that's going to take a month, you know, for that to happen. I'm just going to go to the docking box, which, by the way, you can do online, and they have, they have a physician there, and you know, I take care of my strep throat or something right. like that. So, could you talk about that a little bit? You talk about it as a threat, and why why is that a threat? Sure. Well, first of all, you know, healthcare is a is a huge industry, and and so when we look at this entire landscape of healthcare, um, what we're focused on in this paper is more of what I would call everyday healthcare. So we're not we're not really talking about the hospitals and and you know acute care is what they call it in in, in the okay. business. So we're talking about more the everyday lower acuity types of situations, and that's where a lot of this activity is happening. So no. Um, no heart surgery. Yeah, right we're not there. talking about heart surgery, so I <laughs> wanted to clarify that. But but the, in in that everyday healthcare realm, the primary care doctor um, has been an institution. It's been more or less forced on us by the by the government, if you will, and by insurance companies uh, as as a first step in healthcare. It's it's often called a gateway to healthcare. 
and um, and you know if you go back to you know the old days and and you know the, the family doctors of, of of yesteryear, you know we have always loved uh, that relationship that we have with the family doctor, and that continues today. We saw a lot of good evidence that that the the, the family doctor is still uh, loved, but that love is much more felt with older demographics <laughs> and uh, yeah, and it's, makes sense. and and it's also a lot less loved by people who value things like their time <laughs> because uh, there's a lot of infringement as you as you mentioned and and this threat is that uh, primary care has become very inconvenient uh, we have a, a shortage of physicians it's hard to get into your physician it's hard to get an appointment uh, when you get there you're waiting a long time so it has become very, very inconvenient. Let's face it, the, the, the whole business has been built around optimizing the physician's time. And it has not been built around optimizing my time. Right, like they take Wednesdays off. That's, That's exactly right. Thing. That's exactly right. So, so now we're seeing a, a lot of other models coming up that focus on that void, on that flaw in, in the PCP relationship. And that is the aspect of convenience and time. So the big opportunity for um, retail clinics, urgent care, doc in the box, whatever we want to call them, then is is uh, prolific, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, there there's not that many of them, or th- or there is, but but there could be a lot more. Is that the case? Yeah, there's there's really. I mean, when you compare it, there's two hundred forty six thousand primary care physicians in the U.S. And, and in comparison to that, there's only about three thousand retail clinics. So oh, wow. the, the percentage is very very small. Uh, the the data on urgent care varies. I've seen uh, uh, seventy one hundred. I've seen eight thousand. I've seen one analyst say there's thirteen thousand. Um, but but still much fewer than there are um, primary care physicians. So notably, um, you know, it is it is a, a much smaller segment. So, uh, you, and you talk about this in the paper, but one mm-hmm. of the challenges then is if, if there's a, a delta between where they could be, you know, mm-hmm. before they max out, and, and retail would be a, a good metaphor for that, you know, we get to the point in the 90s where we just max that out in, in retail. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's got to be a lot of challenges then for those urgent cares to grow. They they just can't spring one up, you know, every hundred yards and expect to do well, right? That's exactly right. And there's some people that feel that, that they've reached somewhat of a saturation point with regard to those good locations today. Uh, but it also depends a little bit on where they go. You know, that's that's assuming a static model. Um, right now, the data that I've seen is that about 15% of urgent cares are actually offering primary care. So, you know, what if they started offering primary care? What if they expanded into other services? You know, now they can maybe... Um, Grow horizontally and and uh, and expand their services. So you know because of the the age demographic thing that, that you were talking about before. Do you mm-hmm. do you see them expanding in areas where you know I'm making this up, but where there's more millennials, let's say, like in uh, you know the north side of Chicago now is is famous for its millennial population. So would they that be kind of prime territory versus suburbs? Well, I would think I would think that um, uh, that they would have an opportunity to go where again wherever people value convenience. Uh, so certainly it over indexes on millennials and over indexes on young people. But uh, but for certain things, I think increasingly the mindset is that. Uh, I don't know that I want to go through that process, even um, if I have a, a condition that maybe is just a, a flu-like symptoms or, or something minor. I don't know that I want to bother my PCP. So mm. even taking share from the PCP, not in, in raw terms, but in terms of those specific trips, and that would cut across a broader demographic, I think, than just young people. And there's a lot of times I know, you know just personally, you go to the doctor and there's like 15 people in line. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, unless you're there at the seven o'clock, the seven a.m. appointment, you know, you got like a two-hour wait, et cetera, et cetera, and, and most people yeah. work, work at least ninety-seven uh, percent of us. Yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. Right right. <laughs> so, uh, what are the other kind of big concerns about this transition then? Because now, you know, we're going from a trusted physician mm-hmm. to. We don't really know. Like I, I know from the urgent care that I've been to, I don't know yeah. this, this doctor from Adam. I don't, I don't know his, about his credentials, or I don't know, you know, anything. I've, I've never had a problem. 
That's right. You know, like I got stitches in my leg one time and, and uh, everything went fine. Right. But I still don't know compared to the doctor that I've been going to for 20 plus years. Exactly. Well, and that is one of the things that, that primary care physicians do own that idea of familiarity and trust. And um, and so there's the quality that you trust, so there's that dimension. But as you're, as you're pointing out, familiarity becomes a really big issue. Mm-hmm. And it's familiarity on a multiple level. So there's one is the personal relationship, just that, that you know, I know I know him or her yeah, and, yeah. and, you know, they know me. But another part of knowing me is knowing my history, knowing my records. And um, and in retail clinics and in many urgent cares, there's this, this problem of interconnectivity of the electronic health records. Uh, do they have access to my all my records? Do they know what my medical history is? Because that's very important in terms of, of, of maybe managing specific uh, treatments or specific conditions that I would have. Yeah, and then even still, in a short period of time, mm-hmm. to analyze that somebody walks in the door. Right. Right. Now I've got to take a look at these records and say, oh, this guy has a, has a heart condition, so there's only so much I can do. Yeah. Uh, any other things that you can see, you know, in terms of, like, big concerns about that transition? Because let's say, you know, future, uh, future state, we get to the point where instead of uh, a quarter of a million PCPs, mm-hmm. we get a, f- a smaller number of PCPs and we get 15,000, you know, dock in a boxes or, you know, well, how many Starbucks are there? <laughs> 27,000, <laughs> <Yeah, exactly. laughs> 27, you know, uh, dock in the boxes. What do you think the the big concern will be, both in the transition and then once that that occurs? Well, I think there's a reality that's facing all three of these platforms, and that is this shortage of physicians. And the fact of the matter is, no matter what platform you're looking at, you are going to be increasingly dealing with a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. You're, You're going to be dealing with that because there's just not enough doctors to see everybody. There really aren't. So, um, so what model is going to be able to utilize those people uh, to the top of their license, if you will, to mm-hmm. to handle the tasks and to handle the the things that they can handle, and then allow the physician to weigh in in the areas where they are most effective. Um, so that I think the, that that the whole model shift is going to be one of optimizing that, as well as optimizing these issues of convenience, as well as then quality and trust. So that's why I think as we look down the road, um, it, it's probably not going to be any one of these purely as they are today. We're going to see morphing of these models and, and emerging of these models and, and looking at them as, as a way of addressing these different issues that we're, we're seeing. What about insurance? Is, is that... Uh is that an issue? Oh, it's a big, big issue. It's it's the number one issue in terms of, of what people are looking at when they are selecting a platform. Um, that's today's reality. Of course, that's a wild card. We don't know where insurance is going to go into the future, um, but but today it is a driving force. Now, PCPs clearly have an insurance uh, angle that is yeah. that is uh, significant. But if you change jobs, if you move other things, you know, and you and you're looking at, well, do I have to change my primary care doctor? That's a reality too. Uh, increasingly, a lot of urgent cares uh, carry insurance and, and, and carry most insurances, and that's becoming more of a reality in retail clinics today as well. So insurance is moving to that model as well. Yeah, it's to their benefit because obviously the insurers would love to see you move to the lowest cost um, vehicle possible. So for our listeners, um, if you could, I guess a little bit of a summary, but what are the top three opportunities going forward then in health and wellness, do you think? Well, I think that um, what we see is that the reason why some of these models are becoming uh, very important is because of this convenience and access issue. So if you're a primary care physician, you know, you have to address that. You have to become more convenient. Um, you have got to address that to, to be uh, to be a, a viable alternative for, for new, new patients. Yeah, exactly, and new consumers. Um, but we, we have also this huge generational divide that we saw in this paper. Uh, the Gen, Gen Z and millennials are not 
really fans of the current medical system. They really do not like the, the they're not satisfied. They give them very low NPS scores. Um, they are just not fans of the current healthcare system the way it is. Um, the more they become attracted to clinics and, and to, uh, to urgent care, the question is going to be, are they going to deviate from that as their needs increase? Are they going to morph and, and move into a physician model or are they going to stay with those models? Um, Until they have a heart attack. Now. Well, possi <laughs> yeah, possibly, unless those models morph and they also expand and start including primary care and other mm -hmm. things as well. Um, so, so that's, I think, a big issue uh, is, is will they change? Will those, those consumers move to the traditional model? Um, and we've asked ourselves those same questions in retail. And, and uh, you know, we thought that the, as, as younger consumers age, they would move to, the, move to the department store like all of our forefathers did, right? Well, they're not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I don't know that that's a great assumption to say they're just going to automatically move to the model that we've choos chosen. <laughs> Yeah, I think, you know, and in, in, uh, in all the retail papers that I've seen, mm -hmm. the, the, the difference between the way a digital native thinks, operates, and does, you know, compared to the way a digital immigrant, like, say, 45 and over versus 29 and under for, for digital natives, is significant in just about everything. Not mm -hmm. what they like, what they do, how often they go, and, and this is no exception, right? That's right. That's right. Interesting. Um, so... It, you know, just briefly, who should who should read this paper and why? We really oriented this toward uh, toward all three of these audiences. So, um, healthcare systems and and primary care practices that um, that are operating need to understand what is drawing consumers to these other alternatives and what they can do to change. So clearly, health systems and and those primary care physicians need to read it. But also, urgent care chains, which increasingly there are chains, if you will, of urgent care, uh, they yeah. need to pay close attention to this because what we saw were actually enormous opportunities for them, um, really strong opportunities in urgent care. Um, they've got a balance of that convenience factor, but they also get pretty high quality ra uh, ratings as well. Um, they get good expansion opportunities, so there are services that they can add. So urgent care is looking pretty good in this in this report. So uh, I think that urgent care chains should be taking a, a good look at this. And then retail clinics, uh, definitely retailers in general need to be looking at this. They're increasingly uh, taking advantage of their health and wellness. Walmart. Yes. Those guys. Right? Yes. Yeah. And they need to look at this because the clinics did not score well. Uh, consumers did not really like their experiences in the retail clinics. There's a lot of room for improvement. Um, they offer this convenience, but it, today it is a pure convenience play. And, um, and so they need to do a lot of things to really punch up their health and wellness strategy and integrate it into an overall strategy to coordinate with their merchandise and other things in the store to really present a story of health and wellness to consumers. Okay, awesome. Fascinating topic. Uh, running out of time here a little bit. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything that we skipped that you felt is, is really important to bring up to people that are listening? Um, I don't know that we skipped it, but I do think it, it's important for people to realize that, again, you know, this is this is comparing three models that exist today, where I really think what, what it's indicating is that none of these three models have uh, cracked the code, that it is, it is going to be a blurring and a morphing of these models. It's going to take innovation to learn from the things that we see here and to apply it in an innovative and in a new model way. And and I think that any three of these uh, types of, of businesses could could move to those types of integrated models. So essentially also what you're saying is there could be a fourth model. There, there will be a fourth model. Somebody could look at this playing field, which is what happened to retail, and mm -hmm. go, I'm going to destroy all these guys by either putting all together or you know making it more convenient, uh, more friendly, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, all the... All the um, you know, downside of everything that you listed could come together in an upside for somebody else. Absolutely. And that's exactly what's happening. You're seeing a lot of disruptors, if you will, you know, the one medicals and concierge people um, uh, trying to trying to trying to play that angle. All right. Well, listen, Dan, thank you very much. Thanks for you're bringing your expertise and uh, it was an uh, engaging conversation, which I'm sure we'll continue after this. <laughs> but, sounds great. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for listening. And please pay attention, please pay attention because uh, as these continue along, we may just be talking about you.
pretty soon. <laughs> so you never know. As a matter of fact, next step for uh, the podcast next week will be the WDCast next week will be Google does BOPUS. And I know that sounds like an oxymoron. B- BOPUS is buy online, pick up and store, and Google is the uh, you know preeminent tech guy out of Silicon Valley. So we're going to have the uh, eminent Chris Lytle from Google on the show, and we're going to ask him why Google is so interested in BOPUS. And again, this is the uh, WD Cast. Uh, my name is Lee Peterson. We are here to talk about the relevant works of business today uh, vers- with interesting uh, contributors such as Dan. So again, thank you very much. And thank you. We'll see you guys next week. Take care. <laughs>